Dutch, and I am sitting here today with Emery Moore. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, trying to stay cool. In that yes, it is so hot. hot. <laughs> I'm like dying, but we're in AC, so we're fine. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we wanted to, to reach out to you, and, and I had reached out to you a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and, and asked you if you ever had a chance to kind of share your side of a story and an incident that happened on April 28th at the Capitol in Boise. And for those that don't know, that was the same day that there was a hearing for Representative Aaron Von Ellinger, who has now resigned. And uh, one of the people that showed up to testify was a woman who was uh, alleging rape mm -hmm. uh, against Representative, or excuse me, former Representative Aaron Von Ellinger. And so um, once that, once she had done testifying, we'll, we'll call her Jane Doe, that's what they call her yeah. today. So we'll call her Jane Doe. Once Jane Doe was done testifying, um, she came out of, of the Lincoln Auditorium hallway into the main hallway, and an incident occurred where three people had followed Jane Doe and had filmed her, and uh, you were one of those individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, shortly thereafter, you, know, you were fired and had your press credentials revoked and stuff. And so that's what we want to talk about today, give you a chance to tell your side of the story. But before we get into that incident, I wanted to kind of just back up a little bit so people know a little bit more about mm -hmm. you and kind of your background in journalism. So yeah. uh, where did you go to school? Where did you graduate? So, you in? Yeah, I went to uh, Boise State. Um, I started school there in 2012. I graduated in 2016. I um, got my bachelor's in communication and um, within that I had an emphasis in media production because a lot of classes I uh, had taken at Boise State were media focused. Um, and so I graduated in 2016 like I said and then after that I decided to not go into journalism. I actually got hired um, at Speedo, the swim brand company, because I was a swimmer. I actually swam at Boise State. Um, and I was doing sports marketing for them for about a year and a half. And then, you know, during that time, I always, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a reporter. Um, and so I moved back to Boise and then in January of 2019, I went back to school, um, and I signed up for classes that would allow me to be in front of the camera and get a reel. Um, and so I think I took university television production. Okay. Um, learned just the basics, how to uh, edit, present yourself from the camera, um, write packages, so forth. And then that summer of 2019, I was um, interning for Boise State, um, again, creating packages. And then I had enough footage to make a reel to start applying to new stations. And I thought, I'm like, I'm going to have to go to a small town because I'm just starting out. Um, so applied to everywhere and then just saw KBOI had an opening for a live desk reporter and producer. Applied um, the end of 2019, maybe okay. the beginning of 2020, so maybe January of 2020. And I got the job, obviously, and I started at KBOI in February of 2020. Okay. So I'm still like like in the grand scheme of things, fresh journalists. Um, just a little bit of experience, um, not a whole lot. Were any of the classes at BSU focused specifically on journalism or was it just, here's how to run a camera and here's how you produce stuff? A lot of hands-on uh, classes I uh, took. And then, I mean, when I was at, we say from 12, 2012 to 16, like writing classes. Um, okay like news article writing, um, how to format, um, but nothing like dive deep into journalism. Um, just okay. more hands-on classes that I took at WC. So. Okay, and so when you got hired on to CBS, what was your job when you first got hired on? I was first hired on to do, so the morning show. So my schedule was 1 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Um, I was doing a live desk reporting, so from 5 to 7.30 in the morning show. Maybe every 15 to 20 minutes, I would go on air and do breaking news, um, either locally or nationally. Um, and so just do like little short hits, nothing big. I was on camera for maybe 20 to 30 seconds. And then um, before we went on air, I was actually co-producing the morning show. So I would help write the show for the morning. So behind the scenes stuff. And I did that for quite a while. Um, the pandemic 
happened. We had to, um, you know, get rid of some employees and we had to do some shifting. And so I kind of was thrown into moving to day side, which was great, um, and doing more of like multimedia journalist uh, duties. So an MMJ, um, I was also still producing. And then I just recently got um, chosen to do weather anchor on the weekends. So okay. I was doing quite a bit from not even when I was hired, completely different <laughs> than what I was doing when I got terminated. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. so then when did you start going out more in, I guess, in the field, for lack of a better term? Yeah, no, no, that's great. Right. Um, I want to say it was March, maybe end of February, March um, 2021. So it's just this oh, year, okay. yeah, okay. Um, not long at all. I just have probably moved to the day side um, for about two months. Okay. Yeah. So then, and so what kind of uh, training does CBS or do for when you, you know, you start going out in the field, now you're running a camera and you're doing yeah. a full watch. I, um, I guess I, not of my recollection, I got trained when I first got hired to how to produce um, you know how to look at the camera or to stand but when it comes to mmj i really didn't get any training like i knew how to run a cam um operate a camera um i had to do a crash course how to edit so i'd come in on my either days off to go to the editors and be like okay can you please teach me how to do this i need to know because i have to edit my own packages um so i took that upon myself to learn how to do that um I wouldn't say I just I faked it till I made it <laughs> kind of thing. I just kind of went with the flow and tried to do my best. Sure. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you mentioned in our, in our conversation, and we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit here because uh, from the time of I want to say March and into April, uh, definitely into April, this hearing had been scheduled for uh, Aaron von Ellinger, mm -hmm. and then this whole thing was was going on. Uh, how much of that were you paying attention to at the time when, when all of that, I guess, pre-hearing stuff was going on? Honestly, not a lot. I was, um, I knew of what happened, of there was um, a woman accusing a representative of rape, but that's pretty much, I didn't really look into it um, because I was actually focused on a very huge story that was happening in and in Idaho. Okay. Um, you yeah, of course. So on, um, I want to say April 14th was okay. the first day I was assigned to go out to Emmett um, because we found out that three kids from Emmett were missing. Um, went out there to ask questions, see what's going on, went to the property where the three kids, uh, for the area where the three kids went missing. Um, and I, and our, that was on Wednesday. I got back, I was really invested in this. Um, and I remember telling my news director that night when I got back, um, hey, I will come in tomorrow on my day off if you need someone to go back in Emmett um, and just stay on top of this. So he actually asked me on Thursday morning, April 15th, um, yeah, can you please go out there? So on April 15th, that day is when um, they ended up finding one of the kids that were missing. She was found dead um, in the back of a car um, on the property of uh, they, their grandmother um, is what they called during, like, during this whole thing. Um, and I was there when they found, was bringing her body off the property. I was going live on air. This is happening like, in the moment. Um, all the media was there locally. Um, one of the police officers on the scene came up to the media um, and said, hey, we're bringing sensitive material off the property. Please do not record this. And we all knew because the coroner van came that they're bringing her body off. Okay, so um, the police asked you guys not to, to, report, to report basically her body bag. Sure. And I mean, a police officer asked me not to do something. So, of course, I'm going to follow instructions. Um, I did not film that. Um, my camera was actually, I believe, pivoted to a different direction, um, so I had to go back on air. I did say on air that please ask us not to record this. Um, 
and I just went on with the rest of the night. Um, okay, I, and do we have, we have video? Of yeah, that? so I have video of me so. on air actually stating police assets not to record. Okay, and what uh, we'll do is we'll roll that video right now, and then you guys can take a look at what she's talking about. Brent, Natalie, I'm just right off of Highway 52 and Airport Road. Now, the latest information we were received was from an Idaho State Police officer who asked us not to film the mobile center um, that's right outside of the home because they're going to be removing sensitive proper property here shortly. Now, the coroner's van has showed up as well. So from this angle where I'm standing... Okay, so, yeah, he asked you guys not to film. You didn't film. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what happened after that? So, um, like I said, the night went on, I went back to the station and it was close to 10 o'clock at night. I was there out there all day. And so our show's going on in our, um, this is April 15th, right? April 15th. Yes. Okay. And I just went back to the station and we were kind of, um, everyone that was there was discussing, um, you know, what had happened and from two of my, um, superiors they told me that you record everything and you bring it back to the station and you let your managers decide what to air and what not to air so i so wait did the, the police have no right to tell you not to film you guys just chose not to given what it was just that someone just you know asked not to film um and so but you got I, reprimanded for that because they were telling you it was as a journalist, you film everything. You film all, everything. Okay. You are doing hard news on the ground. You are sent to do a job. You, like I, you take, as a journalist, it's like you take your emotions out of it. My stomach was turning the entire time I was there. Like, it was hard for me trying to hold back tears when I'm on air. And then I just, so I just didn't record it. And when I got back to the station, like I said, my two superiors told me, no, you record everything and you let your managers decide what to air. Um, and I said, okay, like I, you know, I just didn't know. I just was listening to what a police officer told me to do. So, um, yeah. Okay. So that, now that's 13 days prior to April 28th. So on April 28th, um, were you anticipating going to the Capitol or were you supposed to be doing something else that day? No, so I actually, on, I'm still on this story from April 15th, now it's the, um, let's go to April 27th. So that whole time, every time I worked, I was going to Emmett. I was not on any other stories. So my focus was Emmett only. I, so that's why I did not, you know, look into this story. Because I would go to Emmett, come back, go home, and just, you know, um, just wind down, like try to, like it's, it's a busy day. Um, and on April 27th, I did another story um, and my news director actually, actually came to me before the night was wrapping up the day and said, we're gonna send you back to Emmett on April 28th. Okay. So I, when I left work, I was planning to go back to Emmett. Um, and just do another story about it. I then um, woke up and had an email from my news director sent to our whole newsroom of the plan for the day, which is normal. Um, on April, now we're on April 28th, and okay. it says State House Plan. And that yeah, was- what we're gonna do too is you, you provided this email to us, uh, just so everybody knows she, she has the email, okay. And uh, we're going to end up with an overlay over here for you as you're talking about it. So why don't you kind of explain it first, and then I'll maybe read a little bit of what it says. Okay, yeah. Um, so on uh, April 28th, I woke up in the morning, um, and I had an email from my news director saying that, you know, it, it was a uh, subject state house plan, and it gave, like, the names of the reporters and what their assignment for the day was. Okay. So. And this is from... Uh, is it Ryan Haas? Yep. Is that the, he's the news director for yeah. Channel 2? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, and, and here it says, Emery, please work on trying to interview this 19-year-old. Who is she? Ask her to talk about her bravery. If you don't get to talk to her, your focus will be on the noon rally. Uh, somebody else's name that works there. Okay. Please plan 
to help cover this as well. So your boss asked you, and or, I would say asked you, ordered you uh, to go and interview Jane Doe. Is that correct? Yes. That's what it seems to say in email. He's asking you to interview her and ask her about her brain. Yes, yeah. Okay. So I got that email and then I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to the Capitol and not Emmett. Um, and then at nine o'clock every morning, we have our, um, our morning meeting um, to kind of just go over what everyone's doing for the day, if you have any questions. And my um, executive producer led that call that morning, um, and she also said the same thing to me. Um, I'm going to go to the Capitol, try to um, interview the 19 year old intern. That's what they called her um, okay. in the email. Like, so, I did not know at this time that she was going to be referenced as Jane Doe. Okay. It's a 19 year old intern to me. Okay. Um, and so I. And by this time, just so everybody's aware, uh, we got confirmation from Representative Dixon that the meeting officially started at 8.01. So at 9 o'clock, you're on conference call. You're not at the Capitol yet. No, I'm still at home. You're still at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so he, he confirmed to me in the text message that uh, from the minutes that the meeting began at 8.01. Okay, yeah. so now you're, you did the phone call, and where, where do you go from there after the phone call? So then I just start, you know, getting ready, obviously, to my makeup on, my, um, attire, my work attire. Um, I know one of my coworkers is coming to the Capitol as well because our assignment is to um, try to get interviews with um, representatives, a part of the ethics uh, committee. And so we're texting and I said, you know, I'm getting ready, I'm gonna go to the station, get my equipment. And she's like, okay, let's meet there. Um, so we, I looked through my text messages with my coworker and I said to her, just got here as in the station at 9.54. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you provided that those text messages to us to show when you got to the news station. So this is still just about two hours after the hearing that began, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So you get to the news station at nine fifty four, mm -hmm. and and we're what are you doing? yeah, we're about we get our cameras, um, we load up in our news cars, um, we drive separately, um, and I've been to the Capitol before. And so uh, my coworker followed me and I said, oh, follow me, I know where to park. <laughs> and so we get there and I'm just, this is probably maybe, we get to the station at 9.54, we're there for five, 10 minutes, drive to the Capitol. Um, how, far, how far is the drive? Not far, it's... I don't, I don't think the station's too far. No, away. we're on 16th like and minutes, yeah. Um, and so then we get to the Capitol, we <clears throat> walk across the street, we get there. Um, we go immediately, I believe, to the press room okay. um, to drop off our belongings. We um, are there two or three minutes. Go to, we actually would walk down to the wrong end of the Capitol um, to begin with. Um, and so we're there, obviously, we're on the wrong side. And so we have to go all the way back to the Lincoln Auditorium with our camera here. Um, I did asked to get the footage from the Capitol from 10 a.m. to 12 o'clock. And so I went back to see when I actually arrived outside of the Lincoln Auditorium. And it was about 10, 20, 10, 21. Okay, so you get your cameras and stuff set up. So you never went inside the, like, why did you not go inside the Lincoln Auditorium? Um, I just, I knew that our photog, um, our cameraman was already in the hearing room. Um, it already started. Um, I knew that my assignment was to interview Jane Doe, so I just knew that she eventually had to come out to exit the hearing, and that's when I um, could have that opportunity with Jane Doe to ask her for an interview. Um, and okay. so that's why I just, just stayed out in the hallway um, with my other, worker. And you're the mm -hmm. coworker did as well. Okay, so yeah, that's somewhere between 1022 and 1025. You guys get set up now. At 1026 is when Chairman Dixon, because I, I was in the in this hearing, we were live streaming with Idaho Dispatch, uh, and at 1026 is when he announces, you know, to the media, please don't film her or take her pictures mm -hmm. or anything like that, right? And she comes behind the, the black screen. Um, so at 1026, were you just in in the hallway? What were you doing at 1026? Yep, I was still in the hallway. I was probably setting up, just finished setting up my camera. Um, 
maybe sitting on the bench. I know that uh, my coworker and I were actually trying to find um, the link. And the reason we knew that it was, there was, you could watch it because uh, my coworker was calling our web con content um, person to try to figure out how are you guys watching this? Cause they were tweeting about it. Um, and so we were taking about 20 minutes just to try to find this link <laughs> to watch it. Um, and were there, were there any tweets where your people, like, did you see any tweets? No, I didn't see any tweets. No, personally, I did not see it. Did your photographer those. come out and say, no. don't film? And I actually texted my photog in a camera room um, asking if Jane Doe or the intern was in the um, hearing room. Is she in there? I'm thinking, okay, like, um, I got to know where she is so I can, in order to get this interview. So kind of like, just, you know, even still don't know that she doesn't want to be filmed. Um, and at finally, um, we get that link and my coworker texts it to me at 1046. Okay, so so I didn't even start watching anything inside that hearing room until 1046 and maybe even a couple minutes after until I got the beat pulled up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that 1046 would be, and we'll put, you provided that text message, so we'll put that on overlay as well so people can see it. But that's about 20 minutes after Chairman Dixon makes, makes his announcement. And then somebody, I, I don't remember who it was, uh, could have been either Jane, one of Jane Doe's attorneys or one of the AG, the state's attorneys at 1036 also said, it, I, I believe, told Jane Doe that, hey, the media has been instructed not to, to mm -hmm. film or anything. And so you didn't hear that either, right? No, was, I'm at this point where I have no idea Jane Doe does not want to be filmed or um, have her picture taken, anything. Okay. At all. So. Okay. okay. So, and and we went back and listened through the hearing and I, and I didn't see any other time that it's announced. And for, and for those that are unfamiliar with the Capitol, there's no audio in the hallway. No. Um, out of any of the hearing rooms, that's very common now. If they're going to have something outside the hearing room, usually it's in an overflow or, or mm -hmm. something like that. So, so you did not hear the announcement. You had been told by your superiors on a previous story. You filmed everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you were. We have an email stating by your boss, go interview Jane mm -hmm. Doe. Um, and that's, and you know, that's another strategy. thing that I just want to say is that in my mind, why would my news director ask me to go interview her? And I just continue to say, oh, I'm going to be on the hall and I know she's going to come out here to get that interview if I knew she, we weren't supposed, the media wasn't supposed to film her. If I had known that, I would have called my news director, my managers for the day and say, hey, Jane Doe does not want to be filmed. Like, can we please work on maybe a new assignment for me? Um, and if... I don't know if they were watching the feed when they were saying, but I did not hear from anybody, anybody from my news station to tell me or my coworker, hey, do not film Jane Doe. Okay. Never. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Did you, did you, so uh, did you ask your photographer after? Because, you know, he's in there. Does he know what your assignment is at that time? Is he part of that email or did he um, not know what you I can check right now to see on those names yep. that are up there, but I would assume he is. Yeah, he is. Okay. Yep. So my photog's in there listening to this, and I texted him at 1035 asking if she was in there. That's it. Those are the only text exchange we have. Nothing else. Okay. Did he respond? Like, yeah, she yes. said yes, and that's it. Um, so the, the photographer doesn't come out and, and tell you, and Nobody at the news station at all sent you a text message to say, do not interview, no. do not film. Or mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you're in the hallway. Is, is there other people in the hallway? Is it just you? Or um, it so it's myself, my coworker, I, um, state troopers, okay. um, capital um, officers, maybe some bystanders um, just in the hallway, um, okay. but pretty quiet, not a lot of traffic. Um, so I want to say about 1046 is when I started watching the hearing, um, and maybe a couple, 10 minutes goes by and then Jane Doe is asked to testify. 
And so I'm watching that and I'm hearing what she's saying and she um, wraps up and I'm still watching. I still have my phone and I'm sitting on the bench outside of the Lincoln Auditorium. Um, yeah, and I, and I do want to make, you know, let people know, we went and listened to the end of that too, right after she was done to see if, was there any direction by the chair because that's when you would have been listening. Was there any direction by the chair as she left uh, to the media again to reiterate? And, we, and I didn't hear anything. I, I didn't remember anything at the time. But, so there was no instruction after you started listening that, that we're aware mm -hmm. of by the time she's done testifying. Yeah. It says, don't film her, mm -hmm. don't take any pictures. And so she comes out into the hallway um, and now there was a scream. There right? was so we heard a, we heard a scream and we didn't know what was happening. So I didn't. Mean, so she there's there's the Lincoln Auditorium main doors and then there is a smaller door that you can obviously I guess come out of. Yeah, um, yeah it's a and hallway yeah, that leads into the big hallway. And so I did hear a scream, like a loud scream, and I remember looking down the Capitol hallway and I was thinking. It might like a child is screaming. I did not know because I didn't see Jane Doe. I just heard that screaming. And then within seconds, Jane Doe comes out of the hearing doors and she turns to we have our two cameras set up. I'm standing by my camera, sorry, sitting on the bench where my camera is. Um, my coworker is next to me and she says, um, here I am, record me um, multiple times, um, film me. Is this what you want? Um, and I still, I'm not recording anything because I'm still gathering, like, what is going on? And then I, I put it together. As it's, while she's saying these things, I was like, okay, this is Jane Doe. Um, she goes down, to, down the hallway. Um, I then get up, and I have my phone in my hand, and I start recording. Um, at this point, when I started recording, Jane Doe is out of my sight. I do not see her. There is now a woman that I do not know. I don't know this woman is at the time um, is saying, put your camera down. And I said, ma'am, she just asked me to record her. Um, and then she says, put the camera down. And she's like moving her body with me, um, which I just I don't know, found that a little strange. Um, and then I went around her. Did not, I just want to make this clear. I did not touch the lawyer. Um, I did not argue. I don't know if that is taken as argue saying, please excuse me, ma'am. And she asked me to record her. My voice did not raise. Um, so I went around her and I went down the hallway. Um, I heard commotion going on on the first floor of the Capitol. So I went up the stairs and I want to say I'm about. So I guess I want to kind of stop there for a second. Mm -hmm. and at that time, like you said, there's a woman here telling you not to record, and you're telling her, man, she asked me to record. Um, you know, why Why at that time did you decide, I mean, you know, Jane Doe had left your, your presence. Why, mm -hmm. go, why go follow her at that point? Well, because I, well, one, she asked me to record her. I just got told to, you know, this is happening. Like, I think this is a big deal, um, you know, to capture everything of what's happening. Um, Jane Doe has the right to speak if she wants to. Um, and, you know, she told a, not one, but two reporters to film her. This is all going through my head. Um, you know, going back to filming everything. So that's what I did. I just, in the moment, I really thought this is my job. I am me too. I'm on the ground covering hard news. This is what I'm supposed to do. Um, that's what I was thinking. Um, okay. So I went upstairs, um, like I said, where Jane Doe is now with two other women. Um, she's about 15 feet away from me, and she is swinging her arms at these women, coming at me forcefully, forcefully and aggressive. And she gets into my face and says, hi guys, I'm right here. What do you want? And I just, I want to tell people, like, I was shaking too. I was, this, I've never been, to, had someone, first of all, run at me, swinging their arms before. Um, I was scared. I thought that 
at the moment she was physically going to I don't want to attack me or grab me and so I stepped back and I said nothing ma'am and I stepped back and then um you see Jane Doe actually go um towards other women that were filming her as well and then she goes back over to these other group of people so much is going on at once there's shouting there's yelling I did not say one word besides nothing ma'am when I stepped back I didn't touch anyone. I did not speak to anyone. I just, I was filmed. And I think after, you know, after she came force, forcefully at my face, I was up there two minutes, two and a half more minutes um, to record everything. Um, and I did see Jane Doe. Um, she fell to the ground and um, she said, um, what do you, uh, is this what you want? I think she said, um, she knelt to the ground and she started crying and that's when a group of people started, um, you know, going over her. Um, and I think I recorded that for a minute and a half. Um, and then I stopped recording. What did you stop? I just, I stopped because everything, you know, there was a lot going on. I'm, I was still shaking. Um, there's no point of filming anymore. Um, it just, it was a lot. I just, I just didn't think I needed to be up there anymore. Um, and so I was actually one of the first people to head back down the stairs and leave that area. Um, so knowing, knowing that, you know, she's an alleged rape victim at that point, mm -hmm. and as of this interview, she still is, there's still an investigation that the BPD is now turned over to the Hayden County prosecutors. Uh, I mean, was anything going through your head? Like, you know, she's, you know, at one point, like you said, she falls down and she starts crying. Um, you know, were you like, okay, I need to be a little more sensitive about what's happening or, you know? I mean, yes, I did. That's why, you know, I, I could have stayed there longer. I could have been there until someone physically took me out of there. I, I didn't, I, I know it, like, it seemed like a long time, but I just, in my head, I was like, there, I don't want, I don't want to be up here anymore. I, so you didn't follow her to her car? No. There were some, there were some allegations and I don't know that it was necessarily directed right at you. There were some, some people that said to me online that I followed Jane Doe to her car and that is absolutely not true. Okay. Not true at all. I was upstairs and I went back downstairs. Again, I was one of the first people to leave that area. And did your coworker go upstairs with you? No, she still, you? she still, um, she stayed downstairs. Okay. Um, and so after I went downstairs, I called my executive producer right after it happened. Okay. Um, I am, you know, shaky. Like my adrenaline is going. I am. Uh, just you know, like just nervous, not ner not a good word to use, not nervous, just like, um, I don't know how to describe this feeling, but I was shaky. Um, and I'm telling her what's going on or just what had happened on um, everything. I was transparent, told her what happened. Um, and then she's like, okay, um, go ahead and draft an email to all the managers. I have four altogether managers and just explain to them briefly what happened. Um, but she's like, just go, you know, to the rally, um, that's happening at noon. Okay. Um, and so I hang up the phone, I go to my camera and at this time, everyone's coming out of the hearing room. Um, yeah, I believe it just broke for lunch. Right? Yes. Um, okay. So you're back down to your camera and you called your boss mm -hmm. and she's giving you new directions on what to do next. Uh, what happened after that? So, and so, and so everybody's coming out. Yep, of the, everyone's coming out of the hearing room, and I am um, kind of my back is against the wall. My camera is right near me. Um, I'm on my phone. I actually looked at this video footage because Melissa Davlin put it out the security footage of this. Um, I someone hugged me when, and I hugged them back. I did not think anything of it when I hugged this person. 
I didn't know who she was. I didn't know, at the time, I did not know she was the one of the women upstairs with me. Um, you know, like I said, when I was upstairs, I wasn't focused on faces. I was, you know, I, my adrenaline was going too. Like I was just, I didn't focus on anything else. Um, so the so, two women that followed you upstairs, you did not know who they were. Did not, do not know these women. I have never, still to this day, have spoken to these women. Um, and so I guess I hugged one of the women that was upstairs. Um, and that was just the biggest deal. I get why people see that it looks bad, but I just, I want people to know, like, when someone hugs me, I hug them back. It's not, it's like, I'm not one of those awkward people that says, oh no, I don't want to hug you. Or when someone shakes my hand, I'm going to shake their hand. That's a polite thing to do. Um, after I hug them, you can even see in the footage, I do not um, carry on a conversation with them. I go back onto my phone and continue what I was doing, which was drafting an email to my managers. Um, and I think that's really important for people to know because I've had, Idaho representatives, Greg Cheney, say, talk about me hugging that person and saying things that are just not true and that I was actively, you know, supporting what was done. Oh, I actually found that tweet for you that sent it to me, I can't remember. I think I so I'll, I'll just, we'll read that tweet here real quick. So this is the tweet, we'll do an overlay for everybody mm -hmm. so they can see. And he actually tweeted uh, Melissa Dallin uh, her tweet, and so she had said partial statehouse security footage shows small group following Jane Doe after Wednesday testimony, and then uh, Representative Cheney says, so first he's quoting part of her article, it says, quote, footage shows CBS2 reporter Moore, that's, that's you, Emory Moore, giving one of the women a hug, and so then Cheney in interposes his own comment and says, reporter wasn't just being overzealous, she was actively supporting the vile individuals who chased down Jane Doe and who, along with others in their group, I think there's a typo in there, but uh, so he says you were actively supporting those individuals. And you were saying you never met them before, you didn't really talk to them after, you no. haven't talked to them since? No, no, not at all. So that's why I want to address this because that a lot of people have focused on me hugging this woman that was upstairs with me. Um, okay. That's all I'm going to say. I don't think it's a crime to hug anybody. And at the time when I hugged her, I didn't know she was up there. Um, that, that's all I have to say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let's, you know, I, I remember that day a lot of media is obviously talking about not only the hearing, but what happened after mm -hmm. with the people that followed uh, Jane Doe. And there was a lot of things that were said. And we're going to get into some of that in a minute. But the next day, right, April 29th, mm -hmm. what happens? I, um, April 29th comes, and this is that night, I believe, um, the first tweet I saw about me that when people are talking about women chased Jane Doe and said one of the um, onlookers, I believe the word, the term, the word was used, um, was CBS2 every more. That was from Emily Walton. I don't know Emily Walton, I've never met her, but I believe she tweeted that night, so Wednesday, April 28th, and I just knew, I know what the media does to people and I know what people do online. And when I saw that, that's when I was really scared. I even texted, I have a text to my boss saying, Ryan, I'm scared. And he called me and um, he's just like, just, you know, calm down, try to get some rest. Okay, so the, the incident's over, you go home, uh, what happens on April 29th? So that would be the next, mm -hmm. the next day. So I was in contact with my news director, Ryan, on pause only. Um, he was the only person from CBS2 that I was speaking to directly. Um, he... I told him again everything that has that had happened. Um, maybe you know as much as I can as I'm crying when I'm talking to him. Um, and 
I believe he told me on the phone that he said, I think your credentials from the Capitol are going to be revoked. Okay, so real quick, for people that don't know, uh, you know, when you go to the Capitol, if you're going to sit in the press area and represent the press officially, you have to get credentialed through what's called the Capitol Correspondence Association. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty hard. Yes, so I, um, he told me, I think your Capitol Correspondence um, or credentials are going to be revoked. And um, they were. Um, I was online and I saw Betsy Rexel put out a article about me saying that, you know, what had happened and that they, uh, the five officers of the Idaho Press, I'm sorry, of the Capital Correspondent Association um, decided to revoke my credentials. So I found out online that my credentials were So they, they didn't email you and no. tell you? No. Did they email you for an interview or call you for an interview no. to say, hey, what happened? I did not hear from anyone. I did not hear from any one of those officers, including the president, Betsy Russell, who wrote that article um, saying that my credentials were revoked. I, I had no idea okay. <laughs> um, okay. that they were going to, that they were, um, they made that decision to okay. revoke them. So that was on April 29th. So April 29th, your capital credentials get revoked. Mm -hmm. Um, what happens on April 30th? So on April 30th now, um, everyone knows. Everyone knows what the media put out. Um, of course, they don't know what, you know, all the full story um, because they never asked me. Um, but my company puts out a statement. Um, yeah, I don't which know we, if you wanna... yeah, we have that, and and I'll just so this is this is a statement from CBS two, and, and who tweeted this out or put out this statement? So my general, uh, my at the time, my general manager Tom Long um, okay. wrote this statement. Okay, and we'll put this on the overlay so you guys can see it. It says CBS two is aware of an incident involving one of our reporters at yesterday's House Ethics Committee hearing at the Capitol. The CBS two family is committed in the belief that all victims deserve to be listened to and shown respect and we apologize for this oversight. Footage of this in incident was not aired publicly at any time has been deleted and will not be aired or posted online in any manner. As this is now a personnel matter, we are addressing it with the reporter internally. Okay, so what was happening at that time with you and, and your company, I guess? So first? this statement came out um, and I read it and I emailed all my managers um, at this time, I before I emailed them, I'm only in contact with Ryan Hawes. Okay. Um, I have only spoke to him, and he knows what happened. Um, he, what is his? I guess I, I'm curious. You had mentioned that you're, you've been in contact with him. He's the one in the email that morning mm -hmm. that ordered you to go to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. So when you're relaying your side of the story, I mean, what is his response to this entire situation? at that time that you recall yeah i you know i even said i was like ryan i was sent to the capitol to do this and no one told me not to film her like the managers and i i don't remember what his response was exactly um but i just remember him being very quiet on the phone not saying much he did say you know you know, we're here for you, Emery. Um, I know the type of person you are. Um, just, you know, keep your head up. So, like pretty like encouraging words. Cause he, I was distraught. I was crying on the phone and I even asked him, um, am I going to lose my job? And he said, no, he told me I was not going to lose my job. Um, I said, okay. Um, now this statement comes out, I'm at home obviously on Twitter and I, that's when I read the statement. Um, okay. And I was very frustrated about this statement because it, you know, in, in my point of view, it throws me under the bus completely. It is out of context. It does not give the overview of I was sent to the Capitol to interview Jane Doe by my company 
that asked me to do this. Um, they don't say that we never informed Emery about the ethics hearing um, protocols of what not to do. She was not even in the hearing. Just so, so many things that they could have said in the statement to defend their employee, they didn't. And so now I am frustrated. And so I emailed my managers and included, included Tom, or my general manager that wrote this statement. <clears throat> and it's, it's strange that he's the one, I know probably like when it comes to corporate, like he has to put out the statements, but I just wanna make this also clear. I never talked to Tom, my general manager, in, before the statement was put out. He's never asked me about it. Um, ever. I was only talking to Ryan. And so I emailed them saying again, everything that happened. And I said, I would like a revised statement to be sent out immediately. My reputation is being completely tarnished for what my company sent me to go do. And, you know, I would also like to say the statement is not true. I, that footage that I have and that I took was never deleted. And I want to say that because before this statement came out, Tom never called me. Not one of them called me to just verify if I deleted the video before they put out a public statement. Um, did, you, did you tell them you were going to delete the video? Yeah. So I said, I will delete it. I, um, you know, I, like I was saying, I have a phone, I deleted it. I have an iPhone and you have to go into a deleted folder to completely didn't or delete it. Okay. I, so like I have an Android phone. If I delete a video, it, it's like, it's gone. deleted. Yeah. So for an iPhone, you delete it and you have to delete it again. I deleted it and not thinking, um, you know, to go to my deleted folder. I usually don't check that unless I have no storage and I need to delete everything. Okay, so, so the video, because I have seen the video. Mm -hmm. Who else has seen the video besides you? My lawyer. Um, you got a lawyer. My lawyer, yep. Okay, so this is, we're still on April 30th. So yeah, we're still on April okay. 30th. At this time, when this statement came out, no one has seen this video. I have not shown anybody. Um, I was never, and still, the video has still not been made. Like, I've never released the video. Um, I told my station that I will delete it, um, in which I did. I just I just didn't delete it out of my deleted folder. Um, and you know what? And pe people are probably going to say something about this, but I'm really glad I didn't because online, when I saw the, like, false very false accusations being made about me. This piece like, of like evidence, what? Like, like I tripped Jane Doe. I continue to question her. I never spoke to Jane Doe. Um, that no one knows that Jane Doe ran forcefully at my face. Um, that she sought me out. That she asked, she wanted to expose herself to me. Um, no one knows that. No one, like in that footage they have at the Capitol, upstairs that Melissa Davlin puts out, that camera pans up and does not see Jane Doe coming at me. Okay. And so I have this evidence that could potentially clear my name of what these false accusations are being made about me. I like I the a smart person would not delete this. And so I kept it. And Again, I am saying you didn't, you know, no. put it out on social media, no. you didn't share it with a bunch of people or anything. Like no, that. and now that people, you know, know that I have this video, and I, if I was everything they were saying, I am this awful. Uh, I doxed Jane Doe. I never doxed her. I never exposed her. I never said her name. I never showed her a picture. That never happened. Um, and they say I'm this awful person, and how dare you? But the video has never been. If I was really that person, wouldn't I have gone on social media and just did it? Um, to say, oh, well, look what Jane Doe, you know, said to me. No, I'm still protecting Jane Doe. I have that footage and I have all the power to do that, but I'm not going to. Um, and so I just don't want people to know that. I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm not that type of person. And I was never going 
to release it ever. I just, I got it because in the moment I was doing what I was supposed to. I've never put anything on air or on social media without getting it um, approved by my managers. I have never done that and I wasn't planning to. So okay. this statement is a lie and it's a lie and I just think that CBS should have done their job of calling me and just informing me that they're sending out a statement and verify 100% if that video was deleted. They did not. Okay. Okay, so what else happens then on April 30th? Um, so I asked to be um, for that revised statement. I also voiced that I am scared for my safety, that I'm afraid to leave my house. I'm afraid people would are going to come to my home that might know where I live. Um, I was getting phone calls. I was, I was scared <laughs> for my life. Um, and I said that in that email, and so I believe that's why HR got involved that day. Okay. And Ryan and HR called me and, um, you know, cause I did email him saying that, you know, can I please have the weekend off? I'm going to take time off for the weekend. I will be back at work on Monday. I told him I am coming back. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quitting. <laughs> A lot of part of me wanted to, I didn't want to, you know, I was scared. I didn't want to go out there, but I said I was going to be back at work on Monday. Okay. So they called They called me on Friday, and that's when HR and Ryan decided to suspend me without pay um, until further notice. Did it give you a reason for the suspension at that time? They wanted to do their more investigating of what happened, talk to other people. Um, okay. I'm guessing another person they would talk to is my coworker. And I do know that they did not talk to her yet before suspending me. Um, HR actually never even asked me to go into detail what happened. All she knows is what Ryan knows from what I told him. Okay. Um, again, I just don't know why no one is talking to the source like me of what happened. And so I could tell them in detail because I was there. I'm one of the key witnesses that was there and no one is asking me. So you get suspended and what else did you do that day? Um, I was calling um, places to get a lawyer. Um, I was advised by um, someone that I, my mentor, I want to say, that is also in the media world. Um, he advised me to get a lawyer. It's like your employer is not, he said they're throwing you under the bus, essentially. Like you need to get a lawyer. Um, and so I took his advice. I take his advice. <laughs> um, and so I, I get one. Um, I talk to him about um, what happened. And at this time, I'm going, I'm talking about defamation, um, you know, potential wrongful termination. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I was like, we were discussing of why I needed him to be my attorney. Um, and he's like, okay, come to my office on Monday and let's just go through everything. And at this time, he told me, get everything you can. Um, it, I don't care what it is. If you think it's remotely close to being relevant, screenshot it, do whatever. And I did. So I was getting everything. I was recording my calls um, with um, my news director um, and HR. <clears throat> I was getting emails, uh, tweets, anything. So that's why I have a lot of this documented. Okay. So then uh, let's jump forward uh, about a week later, a little less than a week later mm -hmm. on May 5th. Uh, on May 5th, I um, just still suspended. I don't know. It's, I, I kind of have a feeling what's going to happen. Um, and... Ryan and HR calls me. It was at night, maybe six o'clock at night. And they said, um, so we have made a the decision. We're going to terminate you without cause. Um, and I just, I listened and I said, I asked, um, you know, may I ask on what basis? Why am I being terminated? 
they didn't give me a direct answer. They said that we have, we think that we have enough cause to terminate you, but we're doing it without cause. Um, and in my opinion, I believe they did without cause because they played a part of this and they were kind of being easy on me. Cause if I got, it's, you know, when I apply for other jobs, I don't have to say, you know, I was terminated without cause. I don't have to say why, and neither does my employer. No. Um, they did give me severance pay, so they paid me for 30 more days. Um, and so my lawyer even said they're playing nice. <laughs> That's how he phrased it. Um, and another reason why I think they did that is because I was a really good employee. I, I they and another reason why I think they terminated me without cause is because you know I was a good employee. I gave them a hundred and ten percent of everything I had. I would go on in on my days off, like volunteer to go out to Emmett um, that day uh, when they found that little girl dead. Um, I was doing three jobs in one that I was barely trained for, um, you know and. I think I was just so, I said yes. Cause you, I don't wanna, I never questioned management. I never said, you know, maybe I am a little bit burnt out or like I'm being pressured to do all this because I'm still so new. Um, and like kind of like, I have my dream job. I'm, and I also, I'm 27. A lot of, they're coming out of college and they have more experience than I do. And so I am just, doing like kind of fast forward of all my skill sets and trying to be the best I can um, in the process. And so, you know, it just, it hurt that someone that I just devoted, a company I devoted a lot to, they just, within a second, like, all right, bye. And so, you know, like that's, it's disappointing. And especially to, um, my news director that I looked up to a lot and we had a great relationship and I don't think I can ever forgive them for what they did so okay so yeah May 5th uh, you're terminated like you said without cause um, I, you know it, at that point you know let's let's just say May 6th I mean and going forward from that point you know you're I mean, what are you thinking? And and maybe we'll jump up to May thirteenth mm -hmm. um, when you when you write a letter to the Capital Correspondence uh, Committee. Uh, you know, what is going through your head the next day after you get fired? You know, I'm I'm all I'm distraught, obviously, um, but I I know when I need to be strong, and I know that when I need to start. Okay, now what's the next step? Um, you know, immediately contact my lawyer. Okay. What's the next, like, what's the next step forward? Um, and it's basically just, you know, making sure I get my termination letter, um, just kind of getting my ducks in a row, of, uh, making sure I'm getting paid. This is my lawyer is like telling me, you know, make sure you're going to get your severance pay. Um, you know, me and I even asked for a letter of recommendation, a part of my, um, you know, like severance, um, just asking for that. You know, I never heard back from my news director. I didn't think I would. Um, and just, I, I don't know what I was doing exactly. Just trying to get everything in my life together as fast as I can. Yeah. Um, so, in, I mean, in your opinion, why? Why did it go down? You know, you, you've shown, and we have a lot of evidence to support uh, a, a lot of these things that you're saying. You know, why do you think it went down that way with your company, in particular? And, I, and I'm not saying you need to name names or anything necessarily, but why do you believe that, like you said, you, you felt that CBS 2 threw you under the bus. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it went down that way? I personally think that they they bowed down to cancel culture and what people are saying online because during this whole thing i'm still before i get terminated i can i'm in my i can go to my email um people are emailing in we're not watching cbs 2 news unless emory moore is terminated 
this shows what kind of people you are if you have Emery Moore as your reporter just constantly. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that they just, they bowed down to what these people were saying about me. Um, that I don't even know them, they don't know me. Um, and I think that was, I mean, I, I don't know. That's just my maybe guess of part of the reason that they did what they did, terminated me. They felt pressured from the public, from big organizations that are well known in town, um, reporters, um, legislators wrote an email um, about me. Um, so maybe okay. that was one of the reasons. Sure. Um, Okay, so let's let's jump up to May thirteenth, and we're going to get into a little bit of you know some of the aftermath and some of the things that were said. Um, on May thirteenth, you decided to write a letter to the Capital Correspondents Association. So, for those that don't know, there's there was a committee of five uh, mm -hmm. reporters, journalists, whatever um, that that make up this committee that ultimately voted to revoke your credentials, and that mm -hmm. vote was unanimous. And so, on May thirteenth, you send them a letter mm -hmm. and what is in that letter well, you don't need to we don't need to read a word for what yeah, no, I um, just you know basically what I have talked about today about what happened and everything I, I, I added in everything that happened it wasn't just a one-sided narrative like these um, other journalists put about out about me um, it told them exactly what had happened and more of the details of that day and what my instructions were and um, how like upstairs of uh, and then going back to hugging just everything um, and I said that I just you know I'm very disappointed that no one from that committee took the time to call me to maybe and Melissa Davlin's a part of that committee, and she's the one that wrote something about me. I just, I, I questioned their professionalism of why are you putting out a one-sided story? That's not journalism. Like you are writing a one-sided story that painted me out to be a monster. I, I don't know why they did that, and I, and I said that to them um, in part of my letter. Um, to the Idaho, or for the officers. Okay, so and I guess just real quick for those that don't know, there, there's five, like you said, there's five members. Uh, the president, and I think you've mentioned this previously, is Betsy Russell, she's with the Idaho Press. Uh, Melissa Davlin, who you also mentioned, she is with uh, Idaho Public Television. Uh, Joanne Cartan Hansen, I think that's how you say that. Idaho Public Television, Kevin Riker, Idaho Education News, and James Dawson. Boise State Public Radio. So you're saying not, not one of those five people reached out to you and asked what happened? No. Okay, and so then you write a letter on May 13th, mm -hmm. and did you get any responses from that committee? Um, I did um, about almost two weeks later. I got an email response from uh, Betsy Russell, president okay. um, of that committee. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and what was the gist of her response to you at that time um you know first and foremost you personally apologized for not um reaching out to me um and but she her reasoning behind why she didn't reach out to me is that she was talking to my news director and my general manager um about what happened and she just didn't think that i needed to be part of that. And you're saying um, the general manager and, never and, talked to and you. And so yeah, that's yeah. what I want to say too, is the general manager, my general manager never talked to me. So it's inter I'm interested, she's talking to someone that is hearing like now a story that I told and now it's to be told again. Um, and then another reasoning is that they were looking at um, numerous accounts from eyewitnesses that were there and you know, a question, I, I never responded to Betsy's email, um, but a question I always wondered, well, you know, what accounts, what eyewitnesses there, were there? Because I know some of them that were there and one of them was my coworker and they never reached out to my coworker about what happened. So I wanna know who, because that, you know, that 
is huge. If they're asking just Jane Doe's lawyers, of course it's not going, like they're going to maybe leave out parts or just, you know, kind of shift the narrative a little bit because they're already, um, you know, biased in the way of what's going on. They're Jane Doe's lawyers. Um, and again, at the end of the email, she just apologized again and said, it just seems like it was not a good situation for anybody. I wish you the best of luck. Okay. Okay. And this is almost a month now after the damage has already been done. Yeah. And about two, looks like about 12 days sorry, mm -hmm. after you had sent your letter. Yeah. Um, and so Idaho dispatch, we, we reached out, we, I was able to at least find contact information for uh, Betsy Russell, Melissa Davlin, Kevin Reichert, and James Dawson, either through Twitter or uh, you know, Idaho Public Television emails. Joanne Carter Hanson, I wasn't really able to find a, an email, but we did reach out to all, all, all five of them. Uh, and Betsy Russell did respond, and her response is, was basically whatever we put out publicly is what we already put out because I had asked them about. You know, if they reached out to you, when did they do it? And if they did reach out to you, you know, if they didn't reach out to you, what evidence did they review specifically in making their decision to revoke your credentials? And not one of them, other than Betsy, got back to me. And, and again, her response was, whatever we already put out is, is our response. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those were five of the people. And then you also had an additional number of uh, reporters and, 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 and journalists that had tweeted or supported tweets. And so basically, Betsy Russell put out the tweet, the first tweet, I believe, and said, you know, Capital Correspondence Association revo re excuse me, revokes reporters' press credentials for filming the victim after ethics hearing testimony. And then Melissa Davlin, uh, who's also on the committee, said, she retweeted that and said, disclosure, I am one of the five members of this committee. The vote was unanimous. And you're saying neither of those two reached out to you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we got another one here from Jay Bates. He is the news director, I believe, for Channel 6 News. Um, he said, very happy to see this step taken so quickly by the CCA. So he actually responded to us. Mm -hmm. and, and his response was essentially, you violated a direct order and therefore action needed to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, but based on your story and what you're saying today is that you didn't know about the order, right? And, and so, uh, you know, that was kind of his response on, and he, he said he did not feel that it was appropriate to reach out to you because you were an employee somewhere mm -hmm. else. Do you have any thoughts on that? Any response? Um, you know, again, I did not, his response, um, saying that how the ethics committee said told the rules just i just you know again it goes back to these journalists like betsy and melissa that wrote something about me to just give me a call ask if i knew about these rules it would have you know i didn't um and no one else knows that they're just what melissa is saying so Jay Bates, as a news director, should know that there's always two sides to every story. And um, to give out that opinion that he's happy to see that happen to me, um, you know, it's 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 disappointing that someone is like glad to even like see me suffering or is glad that my credentials are being revoked. Um, I find it disturbing. Um, just, it's wrong. <laughs> okay. So another reporter, Sarah Jacobson, uh, liked his tweet. And she, she's actually a CBS2 reporter, mm -hmm. correct? One of your coworkers, or former yeah. coworkers. And when I saw that, I was, I think that hurts me more than probably a lot of them is because I had, well, to me, I thought I had a great relationship with Sarah. We always got along. She actually is the one that trained me to do weather. Um, we've I've always been cordial to her. She's always been cordial to me. Um, and so that that hurt <laughs> to see that. Yeah, so and we reached out to her. I tried to find an email. Couldn't find an email. We reached out to her on Twitter. 
to ask if she had ever reached out to you. And that's basically the question we'd sent to all of these people was, did you ask for her side of the story? Mm-hmm. Um, she did not respond. Oh, yeah, and Sarah never even contacted me in general to ask how I was doing, and if uh, she could hear what happened, so. Um, and then there was Joe Paris. He also mm-hmm. uh, had, had supported or retweeted about, about the credentials being revoked. We reached out to him as well. Uh, Don Day with Boise Dev uh, was also you know, tweeting about it. Reached out to him and he did not respond as well whether he reached out to you. So you're mm-hmm. saying Don Day, Joe Paris, Sarah Jacobson, Jay Bates, James Dawson, Kevin Reichert, none, none of these people reached no. out for your, no one. your version of the story. Mm-mm. And again, I just, I find that odd as <clears throat> claiming that they're, excuse me, <clears throat> Journalists, one of the biggest things we learn um, is you want to hear both sides of the story and let your reader perceive, you know, make their own opinion about how they want to, you know, go on with what they believe and what they don't believe. But it, they didn't. It. Everyone just knows just one-sided, a one-sided story that takes out major, major key things that happened in leading up to it. Um, So I just, I found that very surprising. (laughs) Okay. Um, Several representatives, we already talked about Representative Greg Cheney and what he said, and and, uh, Representative John McCrosty also retweeted and said at least part of the harm inflicted on Jane Doe is addressed. Now, I want to go back just a little bit on uh, Don Day. He's with, again, with Boise Dev. And he posted something. Uh, it's a code of ethics, right, that, mm-hmm. that journalists are supposed to follow. And, and so I'll just read the quote of that, and we'll, and we'll put it up on, on an overlay for everyone. It says, show, compass- <clears throat> Excuse me, show compassion for those who may be affected by news coverage. Use heightened sensitivity when dealing with juveniles, victims of sex crimes, and sources or subjects who are inexperienced or unable to give consent. And then I, I believe a number of people, he was talking about the situation and then a number of people retweeted that or mm-hmm. comment, commented and they were tagging you mm-hmm. in the tweets and saying Henry Moore. What's your response to, to him and that code of ethics and how that situation went down that day? I, my response is that yes, Jane Doe is an alleged victim, Um, but we also have to remember that Jane Doe that day came out into the hallway. Um, I did not know this at the time. She was not supposed to. She was supposed to come out the way she came in. Um, She asked me to film her, not just me, another, my coworker, another reporter. multiple times, um, and she exposed herself to me. Jane Doe has all those rights. She's, she's an adult, and she made all those decisions. Um, I don't know how you can take another way of when someone asks you to film them. I, I, don't, I don't know how you take that another way. Um, she is an, she is an adult. She has a voice to say that why are people, if she wants to be seen and heard, why why are people saying she can't they're they're saying that jane doe needs to have a voice and um you know talk about what happened and then she wants to and then they tell her not to what do you say to people though that might say you know she screamed in the hallway when she came up to you you know could you not tell that she was flustered or angry maybe or you know I mean her demeanor at that time mm-hmm. when she first came up to you you know maybe you should have made a decision not to do it because she didn't look ready or I mean what do you say to those people I would just say I can't I don't control I don't have control over Jane Doe and you know to me she I wouldn't think someone that doesn't want to be filmed wouldn't say that I just I don't know how to you know I can't speak for her but I know what she said I she made that choice to say those words to a reporter um 
you know, I, why a lot of people are questioning everyone else. And I know people are going to say things to me about this, but why isn't anyone questioning about Jane Doe's actions that day and what she did? As a journalist, you're ask why you have to ask hard questions. You take your emotions out of it. Maybe even not even Jane Doe, but her lawyers. Why did your client come out to the hallway? Why did she expose herself to the media? Why did she ask reporters to film her? I think those are very fair questions to ask. I got asked the tough questions. So did everyone else that were witnesses, excluding, um, excluding, um, excuse, excuse me, including Von Ellinger and um, other representatives. And yes, I know Jane Doe got asked questions too, but then she decided to continue on and expose herself. I think those are fair questions to ask. Okay. And then we're going to do uh, some follow-up articles and make sure that, you know, we reach out to some of these representatives, reach out to these journalists, because we wanted, you know, to kind of let you tell your side of the story and then do some more follow-up questions with other people so they can maybe respond and, and uh, to what you're saying. Uh, we're going to reach out to her attorneys, uh, you know, maybe possibly reach out to her, reach out to the reporters, reach out to the representatives. Um, you know, there was... A, a big effort by a group called the Idaho 97%. They called for your firing, right? I mean, we have a number of uh, tweets here that they had sent out. One of them says, our executive director, Mike Satz, witnessed CBS2 journalist Emery Moore aggressively pursue the victim, argue with the victim's attorney, and physically attempt to get around her so she could photograph slash film the victim with her phone and then chase the victim down the hall. What do you say to that? I, for one, I do not argue. Again, I think I said this, argue with a lawyer. Um, I did not physically, yeah, I, I, I mean, whenever this is like, you physically, and correct me if I'm wrong, you physically have to move your body to go around anybody. But I did not physically like bum rush the her attorney. I, I never even touched anyone. I am not a violent, physical person. I, in what uh, Mike didn't say is that he didn't say what Jane Doe said about or said to me. He, like everyone's leaving that main piece out. Um, and perhaps he didn't hear that part. I don't know. And maybe I'm, he I'm didn't. I'm gonna reach out to him and, and, and um, find out because he does appear to be in the video that I've seen. Now I don't know for sure it's Mike because He's got a mask on. I don't something. know. I've never talked to um, seen this man in my life, so but, I couldn't. But the hat even... looks similar to the ones mm -hmm. that I've, I've seen him wear at the Capitol, and I've seen him down there a couple of times. I've, I've never actually interacted uh, individually with Mike, but he does appear to be in that video behind, you know, I, I don't know, four or five feet maybe behind mm -hmm. the attorney, not too far behind her. Mm -hmm. And in, in the video that, that we reviewed, you know, you tell the attorney, ma'am, it basically starts with, you know, her attorney right there, and then you just kind of walk around mm -hmm. her after you say, ma'am, she asked me to record Yeah, her. and so another and reason I kept her. my video is what an executive of this Idaho 97 is saying about me is not true. And I did not, I went down the hallway of where Jane Doe was at. I'm not doing, it's, the, the verbiage that was used is just, it's out of context. It's not, it's just, I feel like it's being um, just not put together, just making it sound like I am just some, this monster that I sought after Jane Doe and I ran after her and I was in her face, but she was the one that ran at my face up the stairs. Like she came aggressively at me. That's another thing. Why is Jane, so Jane Doe now is allowed to aggressively run at people? And not be questioned about it. Like I, I don't, I don't understand. I just like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, and we'll put an overlay of some of these. Uh, I'll just read a few more. We at the Idaho 97 are calling for the termination of this reporter's employment. Um, while we are appreciative of the station's actions in deleting the film, and, and 
as you mentioned, the film has not been deleted. Jane Doe was injured by this woman's actions, and we expect more serious action. Another one says CBS2 reporter Henry Moore appears to be working in conjunction, or at least in sympathy, with the two women who accosted Jane Doe at the Capitol. The 97 reiterates its call at, on the station to terminate Ms. Moore's employment. This is disgraceful. And, that, so, and I think they were retweeting what, if I remember correctly, they had retweeted what Representative Rick Cheney had said. Mm-hmm. And they're saying that you're either working in conjunction with these two women or you have sympathy for what they did that day. And that's right there is just a lie. <laughs> well, is a lie. I don't, why would you say that to about someone? That's so, that's just not true. That, I want to ask them, like, I don't know these people. I never, I'm not working with them. I, just because I hug someone, that doesn't mean I, what they said. Like, I, like, I am lost for words to say because um, it's a lie. That's a lie. Finally, they retweeted uh, somebody else. Uh, somebody had made a comment or a tweet and then they retweeted you, or excuse me, they retweeted, this is the 97% retweet on this person. It says, it's time CBS2, to, or sorry, so they're retweeting this, so this is not their quote, mm-hmm. but this person said, it's time CBS2 to, to jettison the creep you're paying to intimidate witnesses. Emery Moore, Ada County Prosecutor, time for charges, and the 97% retweeted that, essentially saying you're a, you intimidated a witness and charges need to be brought against you criminally. I am on, I don't, I'm on public property. Um, Jane Doe asked me to film her. She again asked me, came up to my face and asked me to, um, you know, expose herself again. I just want to ask on what grounds would I What am I going to be charged for? What am I going to be investigated for? Filming on public property, um, you know, after someone asked me to film her, film her. I I don't know why they would say something so threatening like that about me. And, you know, and I, and I've, I've always, everybody that has said something that has been so mean and hurtful, um, they are accusing me of harassing someone, but they're going to turn around and then harass someone that they don't know and say the most vicious things about me. You know, it's like, all right, you're saying one thing yeah. that I did and how awful a person I am, and then you're gonna do it to me. Um, I, j- I don't understand that. Um, and for the longest time, I did not say anything on Twitter back to these people, but it has come to a point now where I am just so tired of seeing lie after lie after lie said about me. It's. It's just not true. It's not okay to ruin someone's reputation and tarnish that their reputation, um, especially from people that were not there, that they do not know what happened. Um, and so now I'm standing up for myself. I, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm done reading lies, and I am simply stating the facts of what happened. And I, I've never. I've never gone, I'm denied. I never denied filming Jane Doe. I've never denied that. I am just, I'm here to say there is more to the story than what people know. Well, you know, that of dispatch, uh, we've reached out to the media people. People are now gonna see your side of the story. And then we're gonna do some follow-up articles and, and you know, give them a chance to, to respond maybe to what mm-hmm. you're saying. And you know, again, we'll reach out to media people and the groups and the representatives and and ask them if they have any, and, and obviously CBS. So we did not contact CBS prior to this because we wanted to get your side of the story and then get their response mm-hmm. to, to whatever you're saying today. So, um, you know, what, I, I mean, you're in an industry where there's not a lot of jobs necessarily. There's only so many media companies, yeah. especially in a smaller state like Idaho. Mm-hmm. Um, what has life been like? since you got fired and, you know, work-wise? 
Um, well, I haven't been working. Um, I have been applying to um, other stations and I've had a few interviews. Um, it's just really hard because when I do have that interview, the first thing is brought up, you know, hey, we Googled your name and this came up, you know, can we talk about it? And that is, that sucks, it does. I hate reliving it over and over and over again. And I just thinking, is that going to be every time I apply for a job now? Am I going to completely have to not go to a different career path? Um, it's been hard. I remember I actually did have an interview um, with a station and all they all the questions they asked me were was about this this uh, incident. They asked me, you know, the typical interview questions of who I am as a person, um, you know, just normal questions. All they cared about was this. And that also, you know, is really disappointing. So it's been hard and I think it's going to continue to be hard. Um, and either that or I'm going to be either I'm going to just keep trying and trying or, um, you know, become an independent journalist and just do my own thing on I have been talking to, you know, really well-known journalists um, in the country right now, and they're independent journalists, and, you know, they're you know, encouraging me. I, I have hope, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, is there anything else you want to say in closing? Um, I guess one thing that I do think that is very important, um, you know, people online <laughs> going forward of, uh, you know, and this is to everyone that said things about me, um, that thankfully I am a very strong woman and I have thick skin. And, but there's people in this world that, that they don't. And they would see these things said about them or um, people threatening their, I was threatened. I had to file a police report, um, people calling me. Um, I just want to say that, you know, people take their lives. They commit suicide for people cyberbullying them. Um, it just, it needs to stop. It, it really does. And again, thankfully, I am not, I am a strong person, but people take their lives all the time from hearing, like, if you probably take five tweets that were said about me and you, people will be like, oh my God. So. Yeah, I, I, we read a number of them. Um, I think one of them said that you don't deserve to have a vagina or something like that. <laughs> or um, I don't, pretty... yeah. I've heard to rot in hell. Um, I deserve to die. That people are going to attack me when I'm out in public. Um, talking about my family. Um, calling, yeah, just the most, like, craziest things I've never thought I would be called because I know who I am as a person and I believe I'm a pretty good person. I'm a human. I make mistakes. Um, but Is there anything it, about that day that you regret or you that you would do over again if you had the chance? I've thought about this. I... I, for, you know, and that is a tricky question because what I knew that day and what information I was given I wouldn't have because obviously I didn't, you know, but if I knew not to, if I knew the instructions from the ethics committee, I would have won, not even been set to the Capitol that day or have would have left because what assignment would I've had? My assignment was to interview her. Um, and I, I would have called my manager and say, Hey, Jane Doe is not, we can't film her, you know, what, what do you want me to do next? I probably would actually have gone to the noon rally. I would have left the Lincoln Auditorium area. I wouldn't even have been there when Jane Doe came out. So I just think so many things could have happened differently. Um, and I, I mean, I, I wish it did now, <laughs> um, but I, it is, it, I just wish my station just took some responsibility of what happened. I think it made a really big difference. So, okay. yeah.
<laughs> All right. Well, Emery, thank you for your time. Yes, I appreciate it. Of course. And, you know, again, our goal here, uh, when I reached out to you, I, I asked you, you know, hey, did anybody ever ask for your side of the story? And when you told me no, that nobody in the media had reached out and asked for your side of the story, maybe at least after you got fired, right? Maybe, uh, maybe up until that point, they didn't feel it was appropriate to reach out to another company's mm -hmm. employee or something like that. Mm -hmm. But once you got fired, uh, still nobody reached out, I think, until Idaho Dispatch, you know, really said, hey, let's sit down and then hear your side of the story and, and people can look at all the facts and make their own decision on on that incident from that day. And yeah. maybe they stick to what they said back then. Maybe they change their minds. Maybe they mm -hmm. support your side. You know, I don't know. What, whatever. It's up to the viewers. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, you know, and I know for sure people out there are going to continue to hate me, not like me. I'm okay with that, um, but at least they know maybe a little bit more of what happened that day. Um, and I, this is—I don't want people to pity me. Um, tr I'm not—I'm not the victim in this. I don't want to be. Um, I just want people to know the truth.